and I bought that home uh, my first month working there. Huge mansion, eight car garage, horse riding stables. The price fixing impact would be hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Of you're going to tell the FBI you're going to do it today or I'm doing it for you. The FBI said, Mark, if these guys catch you, we're in a wire. Your life is in danger. They are going to go to prison for eight and a half years. And I tried to take my own life. I, I can tell you, Christian, that I basically became a free man in prison. Hey friends, welcome back to Headspace. This is going to be an epic episode, an interview with Mark Whitaker. Mark Whitaker is a whistleblower of the largest antitrust case in US history. It's an amazing story of corruption, of greed, of transformation, of repentance, of love. So much so that uh, there was a Hollywood movie made after it called The Informant, where Matt Damon plays Mark Whitaker. It's epic. You don't want to miss it. I can't wait for you to see it. But before we do, I want to put a plug about a couple of things that we're up to that you may be interested in. So hang in there. Don't go anywhere and enjoy this episode of Headspace. All right, here's the shameless plug. Two things. One, ukrainereliefnetwork.org. Check it out. Uh, the war is horrendous. It's changing this landscape of history. But millions of people are being affected physically right now. As we speak today, as I'm recording this, 69 rockets were fired from Russia to Ukraine. One of them was shot down and the sort of the, the remains of the rocket landed 200 meters from a friend's house. So it's very personal to me. And we're trying to help uh, as many people as possible in Ukraine. So if you can go to ukraineReliefNetwork.org and check it out and maybe you can help us do this, I would love it and I would really, really appreciate it. Number two. I launched a new uh, coaching program called Exponential.Life. So starting with an X without the E, Exponential.Life. And it's a coaching program for high achievers who are unhappy, which is actually a very common combination. I am basically uh, the poster child for that. And I, I received so much mentoring and coaching, and it changed my life. Uh, so dramatically that I've been doing this for a long, long time. But this is the first time I'm actually making it public, making it a a, a structured uh, offering. Um, so I would love for you to check it out if you're you feel like this resonates with you, and if you have friends who this may resonate with, just send it to them. Exponential that life. I would also really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being part of Headspace, and please enjoy this remarkable interview with Mark Whitaker. <music> All right, uh, Mark, thank you so much for uh, for coming out on the show. I've been looking forward to this um, very, very much since we met uh, just recently at this toolbox lunch here in Austin, Texas, where you shared your story. It's an amazing, amazing story. And uh, I invited you on the show because I think you exemplify both sort of how many of us who are driven, talented, um, fail but also the the power that we have to change things and to actually change the world as well for the for the best thank well, you for thank coming you on for having me, Christian. it was great meeting you in in austin and I'm, I'm glad to be able to to do some an interview with you so mark uh, describe to me um sort of the the beginning right uh, you obviously are a rising star an executive um, you have an, an amazing education. Obviously, you're talented, and you're this young executive in ADM. Um, tell me about ADM first, and then what does it describe the ascend to to prominence at this early age? I think as I think it was your, in your either early or mid thirties, and then the lifestyle that it came with. Yeah, basically, I went to college eight years straight from high school. Got a PhD from an Ivy League. University, Cornell University, PhD in biochemistry. And I was 25 years old when I entered uh, and uh, entered the marketplace and and when the biotech industry was exploding. So a PhD in biochemistry was heavy demand uh, during that time. I remember I was vice president by the time I was 28 years old. And oh, by wow. the time I was age 32, I was divisional president of ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, Number 56 on the Fortune 500, 1989. So that gives you an idea of the timing. Yes. Uh, but divisional president of the biotech division, corporate vice president of the company. Um, 
uh, had a 75 year old CEO, a 69 year old president, and I was 32 and I was the fourth ranked executive, highest ranked executive in the company. The seven top executives had access to the seven jets. So I had access to a Falcon 50 anytime I wanted to. I uh, was there for almost eight years. I bought the CEO's home. It was actually the previous two CEOs home. It was the CEO of John Daniels, the founder of Archer Daniels Midland. And then it was the CEO, uh, Dwayne Andreas, for about 30 years, his home. And I bought that home uh, my first month working there. Huge mansion, eight car garage, horse riding stables that your, your kids could ride in an inside arena, corporate jets. I had the eight car garage filled with eight cars, Ferrari, two BMWs, two Mercedes. It was like being Justin Bieber before Justin Bieber. <laughs> That is amazing. You're absolutely right. I mean, it is just the Justin Bieber of the business world. That, that was yeah. Mark Whitaker, right? Oh, my gosh. That's remarkable. When I was 32. And, and well, you were married 72. at the time. Did you have kids at the time already? No, we, uh, we did not have uh, kids yet at the time. Uh, and we and uh, we were married. I met Ginger when we were in seventh and seventh and eighth grade. And um, and, she, and and it's just amazing. I mean, so we were married. We were married when we were 21 and and 20. We lived in Europe for four years. And then I'm at this company with 70 billion revenue, uh, 30,000 employees, number 56 on the Fortune 500. And I'm the fourth ranked executive and half the age of the three executives above me. That's remarkable. OK, so for the audience, because I know the story and uh, uh, remember the, the name Ginger, because she she is a prominent hero in the story. I believe she probably deserves a Hollywood movie of her own. Uh, but please go, please go on. So so you're fl you're you're flying high. You're the Justin Bieber of the of the business world. How did the FBI come in the picture initially? Right. Because I think there was a twist there and a turn. Um, how did it how did they come in and how did that trigger sort of the events that uh that uh, happened after? Well, basically, when I joined ADM in 1989 and was already divisional president, the FBI was already there when I joined. They were helping on a Chicago Board of Trade fraud case. So they had an undercover FBI agent working at ADM to help solve a case. So they were helping ADM, basically. Uh, so the FBI seemed to be there at, you know, such a large company uh, in, in Decatur, Illinois, such a small town. The FBI was helping ADM. So, I mean, the FBI was nothing new at ADM. Like I said, from the time I started, they were there. And then they were helping with a case where the contamination in one of our plants, which then was affecting my division, the, the division that I was president of, the biotech division. And the FBI was helping to solve a contamination problem. And I was sharing with Ginger how interesting it was that the FBI is helping ADM and but there's this huge case that they're not aware of, this huge price fixing case, this international cartel. And I said, it's interesting, they're so helping with these smaller cases, but there's this huge case that's happening right under their nose. Now, you didn't know about the, just the extent of the conspiracy at first, if, if, I, if I remember correctly. And as you sort of rose through the ranks and was, you were sort of nurtured into senior leadership, uh, what I remember is that you were then sort of brought into the into the inner sanctum, so to say, of the actual price fixing. Is, is that correct? And how did that? Yeah, happen? I was there for a couple of years. So so, you know, I start there at 32 as divisional president, corporate vice president of the company. By the time I'm 34, uh, the vice chairman brought me a huge bonus back in uh, my office and a check and and many shares of stock. And uh, and I and he talked and he and he came back about an hour later. It was at a time that uh, to get bonuses was not unusual. We got bonuses often in right. stock options. That yes. wasn't unusual. But this particular was a was an odd timing. It wasn't performance related. It wasn't increase in growth or or revenues or increase in profits. And then he came about an hour later. I knew what it was for. Uh, okay. The bonus. He told me that he saw me as family. That the three executives above me they saw me as family now. That I'm part of the I'm part of their group. And they wanted to start sharing with me some things that they were doing because my age was half their age. Mm -hmm. So eventually they would like to mentor for me to take over some things that they're doing. And I thought, well, I've been there two years already. I know everything that's going on at ADM. And he said, no, there's some things they haven't shared with me yet. 
and they shared this international cartel, this price fixing scheme that they had going on with their competitors. And now that they saw trusted me and two years with them, they started bringing me into the family and being mentored to eventually take over a huge international cartel. So, so when they did that, okay, they bring you into the inner sort of circle, essentially, of people who know everything. What was the extent of the price fixing uh, conspiracy, essentially? Oh, it was it was huge. I mean, ADM seventy billion in revenue, four billion in pre tax profits. The price fixing impact would be hundreds of millions of dollars a year of our profits coming from price fixing. Sometimes a billion dollars a year. So up so to a billion a dollars. Part. It was a significant part. And it was going on for over a decade before they brought me in. It going in on over a decade, even before I was with the company. So so what I what blew me away was that because you think of those numbers, it's almost hard to fathom, right? I mean, you know, up to a billion dollars. It's it's hard to wrap your mind around it. But the impact, I think if you describe the impact on sort of the domino effect. Uh, I think it, it will help people understand what this means because ADM essentially produced and produces a lot of the major ingredients of most of the stuff that are, that are processed foods, correct? So they, they were- one of the largest food additive companies in the world. When someone buys a, a processed food or beverage in the grocery store, right. a Kellogg cereal, Pillsbury, Kraft, a, a Coca-Cola, an iced tea, an orange juice, likely some ingredients in those ones I just listed, likely something from ADM. It's difficult to buy a processed food or beverage that does not include something ADM. from ADM, one yeah. of the largest in the world. So basically the price fixing was stealing money essentially downstream from all these producers and companies who were providing goods for the world, the planet, correct? Yeah, but in reality, it probably even impacts the consumers, everyone that goes to the grocery store. Right. Because when a, when a Pillsbury or a Kraft or a Kellogg's pays higher for their ingredients, that gets passed on to the consumer. Their profit margins built in. So if they have to pay higher for ingredients or higher for their box, for example, they're gonna, that's going to get past the consumer. Consumer is going to pay a higher price. Right. So in the of end, course. the consumer was paying this billion dollars a year or these hundreds of millions of dollars a year so if you find that out and you come home and you now now ginger enters the stage you know in a very dramatic way so to me i was i was just blown away honestly by her reaction what did she say to you and what did she make you do i think mo almost immediately right yeah within days well, at the very at, at, well, at, well first, first i you know i first they gave me a bonus and then they brought me into the family. Right. Then they started mentoring me for about seven months to take mm -hmm. over the price fixing scheme before I shared with Ginger. Okay. Because she was busy and busy with the kids at this point. We did have kids at this point. And she's busy with our children. We had a baby. Plus, we adopted two kids right the same year we had the baby. So we went from no kids to three kids. So she was busy at that point. So I didn't share with her. And, and, and really, she wouldn't understand that much about an international cartel or price fixing or antitrust laws. But a few months later, she did notice some things have changed about me. She knew me since uh, she was in seventh grade and I was in eighth grade. So she knew me since a teenager. Wow. And she knew something was weighing heavily on my heart. And I shared with her, it's interesting that the FBI is working with this. It seems like since I started with a company, solving little things. And we have this huge crime right under their nose. And I shared that with her. And I tell you what, I did not expect the reaction that I got. <laughs> so, you know, needless to say, if you marry well, that's going to define your life in many ways. OK, so what did she say? Well, she said, uh, well, tell me more about it. Let me kind of understand it. And I shared with her about how we were fixing the prices with our competitors and they've been doing it for over a decade that I've been involved about seven months because of my age, I'm going to be, I'm being groomed to take over this international cartel where the company earns hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes a billion dollars a year from that. And, and I, and she started asking questions like, well, who pays that extra billion dollars here? And I told the consumer, the consumer pays higher prices for their foods. And she mm -hmm. started reflecting on her grandma and social security, her dad working at a Ford motor plant, 
and how groceries is one of their major expenses. And she was really troubled by it. And, and so she kept asking more questions and asking for more. And then she started challenging me, why would I get involved with a fraud? And then she asked a question, this question, she said, Mark, is this illegal? And I said, well, it's not illegal, but I'm told that everybody does it. It's the way business is done. And that changed everything. So she, you did say it was it was legal, or did you say it was illegal, but everybody yeah. does it? Yeah, I told her it was illegal, okay. illegal. When yeah. she asked me that question, she asked sure. me that question point blank. But I said, everybody does it, and they've been doing it over a decade. That's when I could tell her demeanor tremendously changed. And I think I remember you you saying that when the executives who were grooming you into this into this new role, they sort of made you believe that... Well, you know, those laws, the people that pass the laws, they don't know anything about business and they're incompetent. Something along those lines sort of to rationalize the illegal activities that were going on, correct? Yes, they for sure talked that way. They they said, look, these laws are anti antitrust laws are, are from the 1800s. Politicians knew nothing about business back then. They don't even know much about business today, they said, politicians. Mm -hmm. They should not even be laws on the books. They said, you can't be in the commodity business without doing this. So I'm thinking this person has been a CEO for 30 years. They right. know a lot more than me that's been out of college less than 10 years. So I thought this is just a way of doing business. And I tried to share it with Ginger in the same manner, but she wasn't buying it. She wasn't buying it. Yeah. But I think, I think, I mean, I, it must be this. I'm trying to put myself in your position, right? You are literally the Justin Bieber, right? Like you're you're the luckiest man in the world. You're on the ascend. You're flying. You are uh, making tons of money living in this massive Having home. with bonuses. Exactly. You're uh, massive amounts of money. Uh, I mean, if that clashes with your conscience, it's helpful, quote unquote, when somebody says, yeah, sort of soothes your, soothes your conscience a bit and goes, yeah, that's actually not that bad, you know? It's not that bad. Does that, was that sort of a wrestling, an internal wrestling within you that, that also took place? Yeah, it, it was, but I made so, I couldn't think of any place at 34 years old, even right. at 32 when I started, that I could ever earn that kind of income, live in a mansion that the two previous CEOs lived in, fly around on a jet, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be the next CEO or COO because they're double and almost triple my age. So I'm already number four. I'm going to eventually be the number one or two eventually. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. I just couldn't imagine leaving. And I thought, well, these guys know more about it than me. They've been right. in business for 40 plus years. And I just rationalized. And Ginger wasn't willing to rationalize. She said, it's fraud. It's illegal. And we're going to really talk about this in a serious way. So did she actually include, involve the FBI and sort of said, this is what's happening? Well, she did this. Ginger did this. She, uh, she was so troubled by it. She said, Mark, she'd rather be homeless than live in a home. And we're living in a mansion. Our kids are in private schools, uh, earning with bonuses, two or $3 million a year with our stock options and bonuses. And she said she'd rather be homeless she was going to go back and pray about it. She was a Christian. She became a Christian at 30. Uh, she would have been 33 then. I would have been 34 when this happened. And she said she was going to go back in her study and pray about it, which I could not connect with at all, what she was talking about then. And, and, and she went back and prayed literally for a couple hours. And she came back and she said, Mark, you're working with the FBI. They're helping with your uh, as, a, as we had in the earlier part of the conversation, they were helping us on smaller cases. And she said, Mark, you're going to tell the FBI what's going on on this huge, massive case, fraud case. You're going to tell the FBI you're going to do it today or I'm doing it for you. And I tell you, I've known her since she was 13 and I knew she meant it. That's a good woman right there. Yeah. Wow. And she didn't back down. We argued for a couple hours about it. She was not backing down. We're meeting, we're telling the FBI today, or she's telling them. There was no way to talk her out of it. That is just remarkable. So you're, you're, you are with the FBI, and I think I remember you telling that she was, she was there just to make sure you don't omit anything and don't. Right. And <laughs> don't... I did everything in the beginning. <laughs>
<laughs> that is awesome. That is such a great story. I'm saying they got so many things to do. They got drug dealers to take care of. Right, right. Uh, I'm the last person they want to talk to. And they asked how much money's involved. And I said, boy, they got so many big cases to be taken care of. And Ginger said, a billion dollars. And he said, a million dollars. She said, no, a billion dollars. <laughs> and then he started saying, how long is this going on? And I said, you got drug dealers on the street, all these things to take care of in the city. And Ginger said, it's been going on for 12 years. I mean, the truth came out. And then he saw this is a massive case right under his eyes. Oh, my gosh. So basically, you were essentially trying to talk the FBI down from making it a big deal, right? Which is which is really remarkable. I'm trying to get him to go away. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> and she just wouldn't have it, right? Yes. So then what happened, I think, it was that you had a choice of either going to jail for fraud or wearing a wire and having some sort of immunity, correct? Yeah, maybe not go to jail yet, but to be arrested mm -hmm. uh, that day or, or wear a wire after talking for almost four hours, bringing yeah. out all the details of mm -hmm. this of this massive antitrust price fixing cartel. And I chose to wear a wire. So I met them the next day. Eventually I worked with four FBI agents, two at a time. And I get wired up at six every morning. They shaved my chest, put microphones to my chest, had a tape recorder on my back with an athletic band, another tape recorder and a notebook, another tape recorder and a briefcase. And I got wired up and wore a wire every day for three years from 1992 to 1995. How did that, how do you live with that? I mean, how does, what is your emotional state doing this every single day for years? Oh, I was falling apart. I mean, I lost massive amount of weight. Uh, people thought I had cancer. I mean, I looked like at 34 years of age, I was looking like I was 54 or 64. I mean, I was falling apart. I was blowing the driveway off at three in the morning during thunderstorms with gas leaf blower because I couldn't sleep. The FBI said, Mark, if these guys catch you wearing a wire, your life is in danger. They could kill you. And to hear that two or three times a week for three years, I was falling apart emotionally and physically, literally falling apart. Can you tell me, just to add a layer of context here on the, on the kind of danger you were actually in, how, yeah, high, it, how highly connected were the people orchestrating this? Oh, these are people that are, some of them were billionaires. Uh, the CEO of ADM was a billionaire and, and owned 5% of the 56 largest company in America. That was the largest single shareholder. 5% of a $70 billion company is a strong, is a large holdings. He was the largest shareholder. He was best friends with President Clinton. He flew to uh, President Clinton's President Nixon's funeral on President Clinton's plane, picked up the phone and could call up any, the last two or three presidents before President Clinton. This was a very connected, a billionaire that was connected around the world. He was good friends with Gorbachev even. That is just remarkable. So, so what happened? Did they go to jail? Did anybody go to jail? Oh yeah, almost all of them, almost all of them went to jail. It was a huge trial. Mm -hmm. a seven week trial. Uh, some people in Japan didn't show up for the trial, but they're convicted felons. Um, so they, they're, um, they're fugitives. If they show up in the U S they would be immediately uh, arrested. Okay. Uh, they didn't show up for the trial. Some of the ones international, some of the ones in Switzerland, like from Hoffman La Rocha, we were fixing prices on citric acid did fly from Switzerland and do their prison time in the really? U S only the ones in Japan that did not uh, do their prison time. Almost all the ones in the in the U.S. Um, did prison time for price fixing. Uh, our CEO, who was the most connected, uh, he was close friends with President Clinton. He was the only one that really didn't do any time, but he was so connected, uh, he did not do any time. And, How did and get, he get off? It was a it was a just sort of a pleading ignorance, or was it some sort of clemency from from a president? Well, what they do, they have a. Uh, he was a target. He was on the, t the tapes and the videos. Um, but with Clinton and with the Justice Department, he was so connected, they do what's called a pass, which you can take someone off. It's almost like a pardon before an indictment. You really? can have someone taken off the indictment list. And he was taken off the he was taking off the the indictment list. He was. 
So oh, wow. even before before even the charges, even before prison time, it's almost like, it's called a pass. It's almost like a pardon before indictment. And he was taking off the, the taking off the indictment list. Is he required to give something in exchange for that? No, not required at all. Usually, when something like that happens, in most uh, presidents presidencies, usually usually they give you a lot towards your campaigns. Uh, usually, a lot towards your library. And mm -hmm. he did. He was one of the biggest donors for political campaigns, including for President Clinton, one of the largest out there. I mean, a huge donor uh, for the, that. So does that strike you? <laughs> does that strike you as literally legalized corruption? I mean, it... yeah, I think today it would probably be more difficult. This is 30 plus years sure, ago. Sure. But today right. would be pretty difficult. He is the one that introduced Gorbachev to Reagan. So he had political significance. So I think they felt that he did he did more good than bad. Got it. He, did. he is known historically to introduce Gorbachev to Reagan, President Reagan. And he's also one that was indicted even during the Watergate uh, from some of the money that was given to the Cuban burglars, some of the cash that was stuffed in envelopes. Oh, so that he wasn't was his first rodeo, huh? Yeah, he was indicted for that. Oh but he was uh, he claimed negligence. He didn't know what the money was being used for and who wouldn't give money to a U.S. president to, uh, right. you know, to, to assist. So he was uh, he was not convicted in the Watergate scandal, even though the cash was was from him in that scandal. So. That went that went down. And I think obviously this is a massive deal, right? It's it's. Uh, it's probably the highest antitrust uh, in U.S. history, case in U.S. history. Am I yeah, correct I think about that? Yeah, there's been a couple of years since, but at that time it was for sure the largest right. price-fixing case in U.S. history. I think there's been a vitamin case that became larger since then, mm -hmm. in the last 30 years, but at the time it was by far the largest in history. So so in, obviously in the, in the eyes of the public, in the eyes of the FBI, you are a hero, you deserve you know, at, least, at the very least, immunity, if not a medal, right, as a whistleblower. Yeah. And the FBI was doing that. They were so appreciative. They they got a full immunity agreement signed for me never to be charged, even though I was seven months involved with the crime before I shared it. So they got me a full immunity agreement for risking my life for wearing a wire. And um, so, yeah, they were, they were giving me full immunity as long as I stayed out of my own way. So how did you it. not stay? How did you how did you blow that chance? <laughs> yeah, I tell you, you know, I, again, I would it was so much pressure and I wasn't thinking clearly. And I looked at that house and that eight car garage and those cars and those riding stables. And I just couldn't imagine walking away from that. And I thought, well, who's going to hire someone at this point? I'm still in my 30s. Who's going to hire someone that wore a wire for three years against their own company? It'd be easier to get a job as a felon than it would be, you know, wearing a wire against your own company. So I thought my career was going to be over for a while. I'm going to have to rebuild my life. I looked at all the stock options that I that that I could not exercise yet because I wasn't there long enough. Some of these stock options were five years. There was about $9 million uh, that I could exercise if I was there for another year and a half. Um, the case was coming to an end. Uh, the FBI was clear I was going to be fired when, the, when ADM learns that I'm the uh, informant that I'm the mole in the case. And so I wrote uh, five checks for myself. I wrote $9 million. I was thinking these stock options that I had signed by our chairman of the company would be my uh, justification that the company owed me that. Uh, but the, but the SEC regulations, you can't, you can't, you can't exercise stock options a year early. You got to wait till the exercise date and what the stock is that day. So basically, it was a fraudulent way uh, to exercise stock ops. So it became a fraud and an embezzlement of the of the nine million dollars that I was trying to use my stock options as my justification. That is, <laughs> so once again, right? This is essentially internal rationalizing with something that you, in your heart of hearts, you you know you're doing something wrong, but it's overridden by something else but yeah i felt like they, and, they, and even the fbi and my wife kind of understood the logic that you know sure, they're going to owe sure. me this if i wasn't fired a year earlier right they would have owed me this anyway and i would have received that but the way i did it there were so many technical violations 
uh, it became a fraud. And my rationalization was I was so addicted to that greed. I was so addicted to that lifestyle. I was willing to write five checks to myself. And, and, and basically, I went to prison for that fraud. So I didn't, have, didn't you have an fraud. opportunity to get out and you sort of tore the agreement and, and said something I to Ginger? I, w w describe that. Well, as I, had full immunity, I had full immunity before the $9 million, But even with the $9 million, the, the FBI was so, they were so sensitive about that. They were so understanding. They were so, you know, they knew it was a big mistake. They knew I wasn't thinking clearly, but they felt like they, me taking me undercover for three years, they felt like they had some responsibility why I wasn't thinking clearly, the right. pressure I was under. So they got me basically a six month plea agreement for the nine million. I had full immunity before. Right. Uh -huh. Then they got me six million or a six months. So you months. plead guilty and you got six months. That's a six that's months. A, okay. If I signed this plea agreement six months for the nine million dollar crime, which is And you a, said no. It, yeah, which was a huge gift. And I was going to sign it. I was praying. I was not praying through it. I wasn't a Christian, but I was thinking through it. My lawyer recommended to sign it. Ginger recommended to sign it. And I was so mad at Ginger. I said, Ginger, I've had to wear a wire for three years because of you. I'm going to do the opposite you want me to do, Ginger. And I ripped it up, threw it in her face. I fired the lawyer. And oh I went gosh. to court for almost three years and got eight and a half years instead when I would have had a six month oh. plea agreement in front of me. Oh, that is just painful, right? Wow. So yeah. when, when, so you go to jail. First I attempted suicide. I was so depressed. Oh yes. With a, Tell with me eight about and that. Half years, I thought I can't do eight and a half years in prison. If I would have went six months, I would have got out at age, went in at 38 and got out at age 38. Right. But by, by now I'm three years older. So I'm almost 41, just shy of 41 and going to go to prison for eight and a half years. And I tried to take my own life. I couldn't imagine. I just was out of, I gave, I was hopeless and helpless and tried to kill myself. And it's amazing. I was hospitalized for a month. I was treated, treated for post-traumatic stress disorder. And some of the things happen when you were a wire for three years, of course. heavily medicated. And, and then I had seven months before I had to go to prison. And someone showed up at my house, and I'll never forget that day. So, when so, so when so when you you attempted suicide, I believe it was uh, just you sat in your car, you closed the garage, and started the car, right? Yes. It and it didn't work out. Somebody found you. Did you pass out? Did you change your well, mind? We had a groundskeeper that showed up every day, almost eight thirty for almost eight years. Mm -hmm. That took care of our fifteen acres and our horses and our lawn and and and, and our grounds. And he showed up like 8.30 or morning, and I had a certain garage that was smaller. And being a biochemist, I could calculate how much carbon monoxide oh. you need and how long the car. I could calculate all that being a biochemist. So I put it in a small garage that was right. – because we had eight car garages. Yeah. So this one was the one car garage where the mower and stuff was because I wanted ah. him to find me and not my wife and children to find me. Got and it. Got so it. I calculated it, and I would be passed if he would have showed up at 8.30 – I would have been passed for more than an hour. Right. He oh, showed up wow. every day, 830 for eight years. And that day, something tugged on his heart and he showed up at 630. So you were serious when you were planning this. this oh, suicide. yeah. I wrote a 17 page letter to Ginger. Had right. A, a picture of my Ginger, my family on my chest. And when he found me, I was passed out. Right. And literally the doctor said 20 minutes from from already passing away mm. when he found me. So mm. if he showed up on time, I would have been gone for an hour. Right. It was would it would have been irreversible. Power. Yeah. But yeah. he showed up, opened the garage, pulled the car out, uh, let the fumes out. I was unconscious, so I was hospitalized. And I was mad at him because he spoiled my plan. Now I gotta go to prison for eight and a half years. Have you thanked them since me. then? I'm sure I'm sure you have, but you know, like yeah, you were mad, mad at the at moment. Time, and I thank him now. I've not actually seen him in, oh, in really? years, but thirty years ago. Yeah. Uh, but I would thank him for sure today. What a miracle. Uh, I'm so yeah. grateful. But yeah, yeah, he showed for first time and something tugged at his heart to show up two hours early. It just never happened in eight years. That's remarkable. Okay, so you go to prison and then faith comes into your life uh, at some point. To, uh, yeah. to tell, me, tell me how that worked out. Well, someone reached out to me uh, before I went to prison. He was part of a group called CBMC, Christian Business, Businessman Connection. Very similar like Toolbox, 
Mm -hmm. uh, ministries at that event that I spoke at when I met you, you know, marketplace ministry to equip men to carry out their faith and their work. And he was CFO of a pharmaceutical company. He said, Mark, prison is going to be the beginning of your life. And you're going to find your true purpose in your life wow. with the journey you're ready to start. And that was seven months before I went to prison. And he discipled me and he had a wife, a lawyer and his five young kids. And he's CFO of a biotech company, but he still spent hours a week Oh my sharing gosh, that's Jesus. Amazing. It gave yeah. me some hope. For the first time, I seen some hope for the first time in several years. Then I went to prison in my second week in prison. A guy named Chuck Colson showed up. Mm -hmm. One of the guys that was part of the Nixon Watergate scandal. Uh, he was White House counsel under President Nixon in the White House. And was he staying? In, was he in the same prison, or, or, or how did how did you meet him? No, how he, did he, he find out about you? Twenty years. He was in prison twenty years earlier in the seventies. Got it. He was president of a ministry he started called Prison Fellowship. Yes, a famous, obviously a famous uh, ministry worldwide. Yeah, right? yeah, one of the largest prison ministries in the world started by Chuck Colson. He oh. read about me in the Washington Post. Got it. And he was not in prison. He was out for 20 years. He became a Christian in prison and he reached out to me and poured into me. And I had a science block because eight years of college in the sciences, biochemistry, I had professors say, if you're a scientist, uh, a Christian, you can't be a scientist. If you're a Christian, you can't be in my class. I thought my my parents were Christians because they never went to college. They didn't, did not know better. So it's basically Christian Christian equals ignorant. Yes, is what I thought. Uneducated. I didn't that with them, but that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. And he helped share with me, Chuck Colson, that first year in prison, that some of the best scientists in the world are Christians, and they're even public, but, but the university never shared that. Even Albert Einstein wrote an article, only God could create the universe and only God could create man. And those kind of things I never sh learned at all in those eight years of college. Never met a Christian professor my eight years of college. That's remarkable. So basically, and he helped me break that science block. So someone reached out to you before before you went to prison, and it, there was a seed sort of planted yes. in the soil, right, of, of your heart. Yeah. And then one, you were when Chuck actually came in when you were in prison. What was the process of transformation there? How did that happen beyond sort of? Well, the, after a few months of reading all these articles and books. And I remember I read a book by a, a guy named Don Byerly, a PhD bio, uh, biologist in Minnesota, who was an atheist, and he wanted to prove to the world that God did not exist. And he studied it and researched it. And after years of exhaustive research, he wrote a book titled Surprised by Faith. Mm. And he said, God exists and Jesus is the son of God. And I finished that book along with all the other books and articles that Chuck Colson shared with me. And I thought, how can you be a PhD scientist and not believe in God? And I became a Christian my third month in prison after really studying everything Chuck Colson was sharing. Oh, that's remarkable. So how did it change the rest of your time oh, in prison? It in prison? I had eight years yet to do an eight and a half year sentence. I'm only three months in. I got eight yeah. years to do. It was a month after I turned 41, June of... 98. And I thought, I said, God, Chuck Colson and Ian Howes both said, I'll find my purpose in my life. But what can be my purpose when I got eight years of prison yet to do? And then I kept praying about that and praying about that. And I thought, where in the world are people more hopeless and helpless than federal prison? And I started discipling guys one by one with the same materials that Ian Howes, Operation Timothy Bible Study, and the Bible that Chuck Colson gave me. I started sharing with other inmates, and I helped these inmates get their GEDs. And, and some of the Spanish inmates learn how to read and learn how to write, and they become the most productive years. I can tell you, Christian, that I basically became a free man in prison, and the prison was that addiction to greed before I went to prison. That's absolutely amazing. I think I think what you said uh, something similar at the toolbox uh, event is you, you said I was a prisoner when I was uh, in business and I was free and I became free when I was in prison. That was such a powerful, powerful um, realization and truth. Actually, right? You were liberated while in jail and you were freer than you ever were before. Yes. Um, and at twenty dollars a month, I'm in prison. Twenty dollars a month, right? <laughs> I made millions of dollars over eight years at ADM, and now I'm $20 a month in a 10 by 10, a concrete floor, no 13,000 square foot mansion with a uh, corporate jet, and I'm in a 10 by 10 with a roommate and a locker, and I became a free man. 
And, and God lifted all that burden and said, God's going to, God said, he's going to protect me and I'm going to learn and I'm going to find my purpose in my life. And I did. And it was some of the most rewarding years in my life. And it's been rewarding the last 25 years since I surrendered my life to Jesus. And Ginger never gave up on you, which is, I think, remarkable. I think, I think you mentioned the stats are that, what, you know, there's a threshold of how long you can be in prison uh, beyond which there's the divorce rates just sky skyrocket yeah, right it's it's 78 percent if you go one day to prison 78 percent really divorce rates 50 percent average it's 78 percent if you go to prison oh it's 99 percent the statistics if you serve five years and longer exactly 99 percent. and i was there eight years and we're 43 years married oh my gosh so Mental she pop. how did she how did she process that how did she stay with you obviously she visited right i get that part right every weekend how every weekend for eight years yes she what moved was to her, three different well, states and lived next to three different prisons and she moved to where three you three states were. lived next to three prisons because with good behavior right an inmate moves to a better prison and she moved to each place every time i got elevated to a better place she moved to that place oh that's an amazing woman right there and and then what was her demeanor? What would she say to you? Was well, she was she months, angry? Was she? I mean, obviously, I, I, you know, obviously, you, she would be angry. She would be justified to be angry. But what was her posture in life? How did she process life like that for eight and a half? Well, years? when she came to visit, even before I went to prison, she said, "Mark, my flesh, I want to run." And mm. she was really open with me. She said, "But God is wanting me to stay. I don't know why yet, but God wants me to stay." And she said, "Mark, I'm praying for you. I've been praying for you for ten years." Because she became a Christian at thirty, yeah. And I didn't become one till right before I turned forty-one. And she said, "My parents been praying for me my whole life." And she said, "I'm praying for you." And then I would blame her. I would blame ADM. I would blame the FBI. Even when she visited me in prison, I'd point fingers at everybody. And then oh, wow. that June of 98, my third month in prison, a month after I turned 41, when I surrendered my life to Jesus, should never forget that time she visited with my kids. And it mm. changed from then, from the last 25 years since. I said, Ginger, I've got no one to blame. And I was in tears. Mm. I said, I've got no one to blame but myself. No one put a gun to my head and said, be involved with pride fixing. I could have walked away from the company and I should have. And I said, Ginger, I am so sorry what I put you and the kids through. And, and, and I apologized to her for multiple weekends and was in tears. And she saw that God was changing me during that time hmm. that my heart was convicted. And she saw how I started helping people and not about the money. I'm $20 a month. Right. And how I help people with no uh, financial reward. And she saw my life change and how I became more of a servant leader instead of a selfish leader. And I tell you, she was glad. She's glad she stayed because she saw that God finally answered her prayers after 10 years praying for me. That is absolutely remarkable. So you early on, uh, before even before you were released from prison, what I remember is that you were actually approached to consult even as you were in prison, how did how did that work? How did tell me how that works? <laughs> yeah, some of the professors at, at uh, university at Cornell University were connected to the biotech and pharmaceutical world, and and uh, they felt really bad. You know, PhD students you get to know the professors a lot better than right. someone you know in your first four years of college. PhD students you do PhD publications and you do a dissertation and you get to know them pretty well and. So they had some biotech companies uh, visit me in prison, and cause some of these companies had me review their strategic plans and their and their clinical trials and their patents, and 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 I and I got to know very well. And they, I had some job offers the day I got out of prison, the day but I got how, out. But but I, I mean, I'm trying to even wrap my mind around this. How, I mean, the stigma of being in jail for a crime, right? That alone will prevent people from. Even hiring you when you leave, right? Or you, know, these are people that are actually looking you up and pursuing you while you're still in jail. I mean, that must be your very, very valuable and very, very smart. I mean, that isn't that is. I've never heard of anything like that. Well, they gave me a second chance. I joined a company with a Christian CEO, a biotech company in California. Mm -hmm. That was uh, that because I wanted to think long. I didn't want to fall back in that greed trap. 
So right. this Christian CEO named Paul Willis thought so long term, I joined his company. And after a few promotions, I started someone the level right out of college. Yeah. And after a few promotions, I became the COO of, of that, that company. company. Still, <laughs> advisory board still today. And I was COO for almost a decade. Oh, that's absolutely it's remarkable. A it was a miracle. A and miracle. You, and but this time going God's way. So tell me, this. you told me something when we met, we sat at the same table right before you spoke and right after. Um that uh, tell me about the your current job with the, with the Coca-Cola company and I never knew this ever like literally I've just learned it from you that there are two Coca-Cola companies actually and they s sort of they, they they have been two Coca-Cola companies for over 100 years tell us about that and about the faith component of the of the one you're working with well basically Coca-Cola in Atlanta that's probably the most well well known worldwide Coca-Cola. The course. bottling side split off from that 120 years ago, the bottles and cans. It was all mm -hmm. bottles then. Now it's bottles and cans. And I work for that side. I work for Coca-Cola Consolidated. Uh, it's been separate for 120 years. It's the largest bottler in America. Uh, 102 uh, plants, bottling plants. Headquarters in Charlotte, not in Atlanta. We're headquartered. Different CEO. Our CEO is Frank Harrison. Different board. We're on the, uh, our, we're on the NASDAQ. Coke and Atlanta's on the New York Stock Exchange. Two totally different companies. But it's the, still uh, the same brand. It's remarkable. I've never heard brand, of that. Same brand. And two so, companies. So 300 beverages, but two different management and two different ownership. Okay. And our purpose statement is, for almost 23 years now, our purpose to honor God and all we do to serve others, pursue excellence, and grow profitably. We have a chaplain in every plant, 102 plant sites, almost 23 years now. Plant, chaplain in every plant, over 100 prayer groups and Bible studies. It is a purpose-driven, faith-based company. It's that amazing. is absolutely remarkable to me. I've never, like, obviously, I've I've heard of those, and there, there are many, especially in the States, and I'm sure worldwide. But something, a company of that caliber, of that, it's one of the top brands on the planet, to be completely openly... Um, across the board, faith-based and purpose-driven, it's it's quite remarkable to me. Yeah, even on our website, our only purpose to honor God and all we do by serving others, pursuing excellence, and growing properly. On our pay, on our pay stubs, on our invoices to our customers, that purpose wow. statement. That is, so, what do you so do for for, for that for that part of the company? Tell I lead the T Factor initiative, and T Factor is exactly that: mm -hmm. the faith initiatives in the company, the transformation initiatives t standing for transformation transformation okay. i gave me a chance at another big company even one of the even a company that's a victim of the adm price fixing case and and gave me a chance but this time to do it god's way and we even do <coughs> excuse me we even do events where we share with people that are christian leaders that are not part of coca-cola consolidated to, to share that you do this for god to integrate faith in your work but it's also good for business. I mean, our retention rates and our absenteeism and our, our enge sur uh, survey engagement results we get from our employees, our 17,000 employees, it's, it's, you do it for God, but it's also good for your business. So tell me, about, tell me about how you see that as, let's say, as a scientist, right? Not just as a believer, but as a scientist. I believe the same thing, obviously. Um, I'm a Christian, a pastor, and a business guy, an entrepreneur. Um, and I really believe that, it, and it's remarkable to me how, I don't know if this is a caricature, a cliche of some sort, where business and faith are separate. As a matter of fact, they may be even perceived as something polar opposites. They don't complement each other. Um, but I think there's enough data to show that it, that is not true, that moral... Uh, business is not only possible, but it's actually more profitable, more holistic, more healthy um, across the board. Can you elaborate on that from your perspective? Yes. When you integrate the two, I mean, you're taking care of your people. That means you're serving your, your employees, you're serving your customers, you're serving your vendors. How can that ever not be a win-win? I mean, your vendors love it, your customers love it, your employees love it. I mean, there's no better way to serve your people. Jesus showed us how. You serve, you're going to win when you serve. Yeah. And it really should be integrated. Uh, they, they really shouldn't be separated. The best way to run your business is realize it's God's business. 
God owns it. Psalm 24, 1 is clear that God owns it all Mm -hmm. and that we're a steward of what God owns Mm -hmm. and to manage it like it's God's resources because it is. It's it's fascinating that you say that we're sort of still in the Christmas Christmas season. One of the most famous uh, Christmas stories is about, you know, uh, about Ebenezer Scrooge. And what we omit from that story oftentimes, or maybe just glaze over, is that he was sort of this this money greedy money grabbing greedy person pre transformation pre the t factor right um and then at the end of the story they you know it says that he had he was permanently transformed right and he says he was he was the best father the best friend but he also they also say that he was the best master basically what they're saying is that he was the best business guy yeah and we uh, feel that. We feel that way. That's why we say to honor God and all we do for, to serve others, pursue excellence. Mm-hmm. That means to be the best business guy, to grow profitably, but to do it in God's way. But pursue excellence is one of those part of our purpose statement. To honor God and all we do by pursuing excellence, serving others, growing profitably. So it doesn't mean that you become less of a leader or less of a good businessman. It really becomes you become a better one, a more excellent one. So tell me, after this this whole story transpired and everything, obviously it's a remarkable story. It's 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 almost it's it's remarkable Hollywood level remarkable, which is why Hollywood made a movie out of it, right? And um, so, how was your experience with? I think Matt Damon played you. I mean, that you yes, must have felt my identical twin, my twin. Your twin, obviously, he was almost as good looking as as you are. Uh, so Matt Damon plays you. And, uh, and how is it? Tell me, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're all curious about Hollywood and things like that. How was that experience? Did you go to the premiere? Did they, you know, did they, you know, bring you in alongside? Did they, um, did they say things to you? How, how was the interaction with the director? The yeah, he, actors? he actually had my watch. He had my real business card. He had a couple of the real ties. Really? He brought us six months in before uh, the movie was released to see the movie along with them. Uh, we walked the premiere with Matt Damon and the and the director. Now the director was it's not a Christian, so he it's not a it's not a redemption story. It's a crime drama, right? And it yeah. left it doesn't have any of our fate. It ends with me in prison, so it doesn't show the last twenty five years and what God's done in yeah. my life since. But we got to share that with them, especially even with Matt Damon. We even shared our book, Mark Whitaker Against All Odds, which is what we shared here today, talking with you, our faith journey. We even shared that with him and his wife. Luciana and I could tell they were blown away by our marriage surviving when it survived, and they knew there was something different about us, especially about Ginger, that could survive that and our yeah. marriage survive. Absolutely, absolutely! Wow, that's so remarkable. I think it planted a seed. I think it planted a seed with a lot of them. That's wonderful. That's one, and I, you know what? I saw the. I heard your story obviously firsthand. Then I saw the documentary, which is as sort of the real story, and the FBI agents were being interviewed, etc. Then I saw, also saw the, the 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 informant, which is the the Hollywood movie, and I could tell like immediately because I've seen this movie before. I've seen it before. I didn't remember a lot of the details, but I've seen it before, and I remember going, "Yeah, they're 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 taking a, a lot of creative liberty here with the story. Like it's a little bit of a comedy. They make you feel look a little quirky and strange and." Yeah. And and they the omit FBI, so much. They had delude. And even Ginger, such a serious person, they kind of take the seriousness yeah. out of every role. It's almost like a every... crime crime uh, novel comedy genre. Yeah. I mean, so so obviously yeah. they they can do that, and yeah, you know, they can, can take liberties. Uh, but I remember thinking after s- listening to you and and seeing the documentary, I'm like, yeah, that's not the real story. There's probably there there's pieces. There's like highlights of the story, but it's not the real story. Well, I think the real story is what God took our life from Asher to beauty. Yeah. And a story today, I would say, thank God, Ginger says it too, I did not sign a six-month plea agreement because I would have never listened to Ian Howells. I would have never listened to Chuck wow. Colson. We look back, thank God I did not sign that plea agreement because God gave me exactly what I needed. Uh, Ginger thinks the eight and a half years, I think two years would have been enough. But <laughs> I do agree. I do agree that six months, I, I don't think I would have listened to them. I needed to be broken and needed to have all those worldly distractions out of my way and to be humbled. Severe mercy, me, isn't it? Yeah, severe mercy. So, wow, that's just remarkable. And thank you so much for sharing that story with us. And 
And this is the, the, the second time I hear it, and I, you and I have been communicating. It's, it still blows me away. So uh, before I let you go, if I, could, if I could ask you for one thing, imagine or people in our audience, people that listen to this podcast and watch it on YouTube, uh, talented, gifted, driven, want to change the world, um, clearly up to great things. What would you say to them when it comes to building a life that combines changing the world and having an impact and having success in life, but also not losing your soul, I guess, right? What would you say, maybe one or two or three tips of how to, how to navigate that properly? Well, here's what I would say to them. And here's what I would say to my younger self, my 32-year-old self. Yeah. at the time that to live a life of significance is so much more rewarding than a life of success. Me helping these men in prison became a life of significance. Even at $20 a month, it became a mission field. It was like I was a missionary and God used that even during that time. And he, and he gave me the skill set to continue to serve even when I got out almost two decades ago out of prison. So and, and, when, and I think back, people could drive by my house in a mansion with these big iron gates. And I had a corporate jet and a horse riding stables and an inside arena, eight car garage with a Ferrari and Mercedes and BMWs, eight cars in that garage. And people say that man has everything. I had a void in my heart the size of Grand Canyon. Hmm. After I get a Ferrari, two weeks later, I'm thinking, what's next? After I had a Falcon 50, I'm thinking there's got to be something more to this. What's next? And then I'm in prison at $20 a month. That void was filled. Mm. The, it gave me purpose. And a purpose driven for a life of significance is so much more rewarding than what the world, how the world defines success. If you chase the things the way the world defines success, it will be an empty life. And that's the track I was on. Mm. I'm so glad you, you were, perhaps it took a while, right, for you to get it but you shifted in the impact that you're having now working for the one of the actual companies that, 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 that your original company was defrauding yes. um, and having an impact that is at such a large scale uh, with businesses, with T factor, with thousands of employees uh, being changed and transformed and inspired. Uh, but even more than that, I think the story of redemption of transformation is such a powerful story that it's never too late, then anybody can change, and you can have a life of significance that is uh, by far a happier life than uh, a life of just material success uh, and fortune and fame. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the message. That's the journey I've, I've experienced the last 30 years. Wow. Wow. That's wonderful. Well, Mark, thank you for coming on. Uh, it's been an honor and to meet you and to hear your story and to have you on the show. I really pray that this um, this changes hearts and minds and just trajectories of lives, actually, uh, of someone listening to it. Maybe someone that is sort of making the same mistakes, someone who's just flirting with, with greed a bit too much. Um, I, I just really pray that it changed lives. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. Thank you for having me.